Hello and welcome to this video and in the video I want to talk about a number of different authentication and authorization protocols that you might have seen banded around and really in recent months and years we've seen lots of uh, issues of people's passwords being stolen from sometimes quite large websites, quite well-known websites and really I don't think the developers currently and architects really have a good enough security awareness and one of these particular areas is to do with authentication or if you like logging into a site and so I just want to give you guys some background in where these protocols came from what they're for uh, and the pros and cons of each of them and really to kind of help point you in the way that you want to move forwards so the first thing that we need to understand is that authentication and authorization are not the same thing. Clearly, they are related and they sound like they're the same thing, but they're not. Uh, and if you get those two things confused, then you will find some other topics confusing as well. So authentication asks a very simple question. Who are you? And authorization asks, what can this entity do? So this entity might be anonymous, they might be a user. Authorization is saying, what permissions does this entity have? Authentication is very specifically asking who the person is. So we sometimes shorten these. Authentication is sometimes referred to as AuthX and authorization as AuthN, just to be uh, even more confusing. But I tend to remember that authorization has an N at the end, or it sounds like it has an, um, an N at the end. So I kind of re remember that one and, and work them out uh, the other way around. But you can call them whatever you like for now. So authentication, we're basically asking an entity to make a provable claim about their identity. So a claim is often an email address or a username. So when somebody logs into a site, they are claiming uh, a, an email address or that username for themselves. And almost always that proof is in the form of a password. So by putting in a password for that uh, email address, I'm proving that that is indeed part of my identity. And then the site's hopefully going to let me in. Obviously, it can include uh, two and three factor solutions as well. So talking about hardware tokens or Google Authenticator on your mobile phone or um, a biometric reader of some kind. So a, a whole load of factors. But for now, we're not too um, worried about those. We're going to just look at a single factor. It's worth mentioning, again, not relevant for our examples in this uh, video, but the, auth the authentication entity is not always a person. So it is possible for a system to authenticate to another system. To all intents and purposes, that's kind of the same thing because the system still has to prove a claim about their identity using another piece of information. And again, it could very well be a username and a password, uh, even though we're not talking about a human being. It's also worth mentioning as well that an entity, let's assume we're talking about a person, can have multiple identities. So I have subsets of informa uh, information about myself and different uh, systems will have different sets of that data. So my bank will have a lot more data on me than a random website like Reddit or Facebook or so somebody like that. So all of those different identities provide an amount of information about an entity and each website, each application is going to be asking how much identity information do they need in order to be confident that they know who I am. So just to make this simple for, again, our video, we're going to say that in this case, an entity is a person, a human being. We're going to say that the claim they're going to make is their email address. And we're going to say that the proof that they need to provide is a password. And so we'll just kind of keep it really simple so that we can kind of get through some of the ways in which we authenticate. What is really important, however, is to talk briefly about registration. Now, the protocols we're going to be looking at are not primarily concerned with registration, but clearly if your registration system doesn't work properly, then the actual protocol itself is kind of irrelevant because your system can already have been compromised. So we need to be asking at registration stage the question of how do I validate that this person really does 
um, own the claims that they're making about themselves. So, you know, a very simple example is we could uh, send somebody a text message or give them an automated phone call or even a manual phone call to say, I'm verifying that your phone number is correct by talking to you. They could send a letter to your address, but almost always, again, um, the proof is basically you can access your email and you're going to prove that by clicking on a link in a validation email. And of course, if there's any risk at all to the system, then that validation has to occur. Otherwise, you're effectively allowing a user to impersonate somebody else by claiming somebody else's email address. Um, and of course, that could take um, or could cause many different risks and vulnerabilities to your system, the data that you hold and the actions that your application takes. Now, it should be mentioned even at this stage that just because somebody can click on a link in an email doesn't prove that they are the owner of that email address. It only proves that at this point in time, they have access to that email. So if somebody leaves their laptop logged in, there's a chance that somebody could impersonate somebody else. And with that knowledge, again, your application needs to decide how much you uh, are going to how much trust you're going to put in that information, whether you're going to send additional validation emails at a later date or, or, or whatever it is that you decide to do. But registration is really important. If there is no validation, you can't make any assumptions about the kind of assurance. But again, let's just assume for now that your registration is solid, that whatever you've done has proved beyond any reasonable doubt that this person who is signing up owns a particular email address. Um, again, if we don't assume that, then there's lots of uh, lots of risks, lots of problems, lots of things to talk about. Authorization is basically saying once I have an identity, I can check permissions. Is this entity that's identified by whatever they've claimed able to do certain things? Now, again, it's worth mentioning quickly that an identity might be anonymous, so you can still check permissions before somebody has been authenticated. And in that case, you're asking what permissions can an anonymous user have? So they might be able to see a number of pages. They might be able to add items to a basket even, but you would say that you're not allowed to check out until you've authenticated. So authorization really is just um, concerned with permissions. And those permissions can affect all kinds of things like your menus, your page access, even function level ac access to certain things within a single page the text labels that are displayed, extra content that the administrator might see, all, all those kinds of things can all be affected by authorization. Um, and although you'll see the use of the word role quite a lot when we're talking about authorization, it should be mentioned as well that roles are not required for authentication and authorization. They are merely a convenience that makes it easier to manage authorization. So, just because we don't see this word role coming up in these next few slides, uh, don't worry about that. Roles are a convenience. They're not mandatory. So let's talk about the default implementation of authentication. In nearly all frameworks, we've got a username and or an email address and a password. So that's kind of fine. We probably know about that. Some frameworks have no authentication by default, which is a bit worrying. It means that you start with a, an empty framework and you have to put that in yourself. And of course, the danger straight away is that the developer or the architect is then being relied upon to know how to do this properly. And if you're like me, the first thing you're going to do is go into a search engine and say, adding authentication to Drupal or something like that. I search and I'm probably going to click on the first article and I'm going to do what it says to do. So if I don't have enough understanding straight away, I create a risk because I'm doing something that I don't really know how to do. Um, although some frameworks don't have any authentication, it's much more common that frameworks have no authorization by default. And really, that's a convenience issue. Having a permission check-in dotted all around your application can be quite complex to set up. And of course, you don't have to have authorization. If you only have one level of user, um, then you might not need authorization at all. But again, it's something else that we have to work out how to bolt in, how to do it properly. So again, we've got lots of um, places there for risk. <laughs>
the uh, in terms of implementing these extra modules it depends on the framework entirely some of them are very easy to implement you run a composer package or you you run some kind of graphical tool and it will do it all for you Others are a bit more difficult and require you to do some reading, to do some research, to find an example, to do on the command line or to do in code. So really, there's a lot of variation there. And it's just something else that the developer uh, might have to worry about. One of the problems as well is there's, there's little objective way of measuring what these systems are, are like by default. So... If, if somebody says, how secure is the Drupal authentication mechanism, that's not really a very easy question to answer because, of course, it depends on many things, not least of which is whether the developer or the architect has implemented it correctly. But even if they have, have they set it up correctly? Have they put the correct numbers in? Um, and there's a whole load of other issues around password management, like what happens if your passwords are stolen? Do you have a reset mechanism? Can the user reset their own password? How do they reset it? So it's, it's actually quite a hard number to place on a system, which then means, well, how do I know? How can I have assurance that my password's default implementation is actually secure. And unless you have a good knowledge of password systems and of good security practice, you're probably not going to be able to answer that. So what is the problem then um, with the default implementation, apart from the, the kind of general stuff I've already talked about? Well, one of the things is we lack convenience. We have a variable security uh, implementation or a measure of security in our system. Collaboration between different websites is impossible by default or certainly impossible without writing a load of your own code and unattended, unattended access would not be secure and um, by unattended access I'm talking about a system that has to access an API at a later date to query something or other if they're accessing that on behalf of the user then that's not going to be secure and why is that well let's just dart through these People now use, as you know, as you probably do, hundreds or thousands of websites on a regular basis, and many sites require registration. We don't always know where, why they do that, whether it's just a, a, a convenience from their point of view, whether they're trying to get our data, but they're all asking for registration, which is very inconvenient to the end user having to register for the 50th time that week. Um, and even if your site might really need them to sign up because of the type of service that you provide, they might not because it's just a hassle. So having a, a log on per site is very inconvenient. That's kind of obvious. Security, as we've already talked about, the security built in mechanisms is generally OK, but they can be easily broken if they're not implemented properly or if they have other peripheral side channel attacks. You haven't locked down your files on your web server properly. You haven't locked down the web server properly. You've opened up other ports. Um, so there's lots of ways it can be broken. Very, very unfortunately, the information that you find in books and on forums can have very poor code examples. If you find a book learning how to code PHP or .NET or anything else, the chance of the examples being secure by default is very low. And when you don't know what you're doing, you're going to trust in a book or a forum because you, you want to find out how to do it. And the advice that you get can be very poor. My experiences at developer awareness of basic security is still very severely lacking. I've recently interviewed a number of developers, some of whom have got 10, 15 years or more in the industry, who still can't look through a piece of code and find out where all the security vulnerabilities are. And because of that, in most cases, we can't simply assume that a developer knows how to do something in a secure way. Of course, we also have a reality that we have existing sites which can be very hard to update. They've got code based on stuff from years and years ago. It might be an old language. We might have no more uh, developers who even know how to, to modify it. But also, these things are brittle. They break very easily when we change them. So um, we can't always replace them because they might cost thousands or millions of pounds to replace and take several years to do as well. So we've got all of those kind of realities in there. 
And one of the ones that makes passwords really quite vulnerable is that we know that people share them across lots of different sites. If you share them across sites, then you only need one site to be broken to expose the other sites. Your site might be the one that gets broken or your site might be the one that gets compromised because someone else's site is broken. So all of these issues um, are to do with security. Collaboration is also an issue. Nowadays, we've got lots of organization. All of these guys have got their own applications. They might have uh, several applications within the same organization, and they kind of want people to play nicely because by default, the user has to register multiple times and would have to log in multiple times just to use several different applications within a company. Um, another thing that makes it slightly messy is that software as a service companies there maybe have multi-tenancy, multi-hosting, all kinds of stuff, and they need flexibility in their authentication, um, which you don't get by default. You don't necessarily want somebody to log into one site and be able to access several others. You might want to separate them all out. So again, the default mechanisms don't really give the flexibility that a software as a service provider needs. And then just a, a very simple thing, a company buys another company, they kind of want single sign on again, they don't want people to have to log in to 10 different divisions of the same company. But again, that single sign on isn't available by default um, with a framework unless you've wired it in to do that, in which case um, you might be um, sharing the security risks that you've created across many places rather than getting the strength um, of, a, of a decent single sign on provider. So then uh, with unattended access, again, we live in a world with APIs and these are usually accessed on behalf of the user. We can't really do that because by default, we would have to store the user's credentials in, in a reversible or insecure way in order for the system to then call those APIs on behalf of the user. Clearly, that's not an ideal scenario. So this then brings us to the different solutions that we have. We have the SAML kind of shibboleth world we have something called OpenID, we have OAuth2, and then what I want to finish you with, which is OAuth2 plus OpenID Connect. There are others. Um, these are probably the most common ones that you'll encounter. Several others are maybe more specialized or they're much older and have probably been largely discontinued. Again, in real life, you might have some of these that you have to use because of existing systems, but we'll kind of see what the problems are with each of these. So SAML and Shibboleth, SAML stands for Security Assertion Markup Language uh, and was created in 2001 from intellectual property from several businesses. And it's really quite a high level protocol because it's designed basically for exchanging security assertions. So what that means is I'm going to make a claim, I can send it to you, but I can send it to you in a way that you can then prove that I have made that claim using digital signatures so that it can't be tampered with on route, it can't be changed, I can rely on the assertions that you're making. But being a very high level um, protocol, it's kind of its functionality is limited to people who've got the time to really invest in making concrete implementations for SAML. So it is mature. It's been around a long time. But because it's old, you can argue that lots of the decisions that were taken that made sense um, 15 years ago and now don't make sense in the modern world. One of these, which is kind of a big deal, is that it's based on XML, which at the time was the silver bullet to be used in everybody's computer systems. But XML has a whole raft of problems. It's, it's self-documenting and it kind of looks like it should be simple. But in many cases... As soon as you start implementing schemas for your XML and validation and parsers, you start to realize there are a lot of differences between different implementations, that what works on one system doesn't work on another. Um, and when you get schema errors, you can't always easily work out what's going on. And all of that overhead is just taken on just to use XML before you've even got to the actual content inside the XML documents themselves. Shibboleth is a Java-based um, authentication implementation for SAML. It's Java-based, which brings in all of its own problems. Java itself is, uh, you know, very large and unwieldy. It's not very developer-friendly. It takes a lot of understanding to get stuff up and running. Lots of kind of strange decisions in the um, in terms of 
coding standards and, and how to write Java, as well as all the issues with Java virtual machines and how all of that works. It tends to be very configuration heavy as well, and it's not massively popular um, with developers for that reason. Basically, SAML is a kind of tightly bound, strongly checked type of protocol and theoretically strong means that it's complicated to implement. And in reality, lots of people are not fond of SAML Shibboleth. It's, it's, a, it's a big beast to try and get into your organization. You might already have it, but if you do, you probably already know how complicated it can be just for something that sounds like it should be very simple, which is to um, exchange security assertions. So OpenID is a slightly different kind of beast here. OpenID is very much open source and it is specifically for authentication. So it's a much more specialized protocol. Again, it's created quite a long time ago. And one of its ideas was to be decentralized, which is great, but it does then introduce trust issues. How do I know whether I can trust the OpenID provider? Because the original plan was that any OpenID provider could be used on any site that supports OpenID. But of course, that doesn't really work in practice because how do I know whether I can trust that OpenID provider? I can verify that it made a claim about a user, but so what? Anyone can call me up and make a claim about something unless I trust the person making the claim then I'm not going to trust the claim that they make. So there are kind of certain trust issues. There's also a discovery protocol, which it was designed to make things easier because the basic idea is rather than setting up loads of configuration, I can instead expose it in a document. And then when a relying party, which is the site that's using my identity provider, when they want to plug into me, they just point at the discovery document and everything gets configured automatically. Again, with all of that convenience comes complexity, uh, comes, you know, learning curve issues. It's, you know, ends up getting quite difficult, quite messy. The documentation, as there as is the case in almost every protocol, is arguably terse. It's to the point it's hard to understand when you're new to a system and you don't know how it works. What you don't want to do is see a whole load of documentation, very wordy um, explanations of things which don't really make very much sense. Um, and sadly, most organizations don't really invest in making that documentation easy to understand. And as a result, um, people don't don't want to use it. URLs and XML again, developers don't like it. It's hard to debug. It's hard to get it working sometimes. Separating the idea of a URL as an identifier and a URL as a location is very difficult, again, for people to do. And the reality, the result was just that there was very poor developer take up with OpenID. A few of the bigger companies, Googles, your Twitters, your Facebooks, those kind of people were using it originally, but almost all of them now have deprecated it because it's too complicated and people are not using it, so they don't want to maintain it anymore. So this brings us then to OAuth or OAuth 2, probably the best known of uh, the protocols, but the first bombshell is that OAuth 2 is very specifically not an authentication protocol. It is an authorization protocol and it was designed for API access. It was designed for the problem of how do I allow a user to authorize a system to access their data on behalf of the user. Example, Facebook, Facebook friend list. How do I authorize another system to access my Facebook friends list now and possibly over the next days and weeks on my behalf in a secure way? That was the question that OAuth 2 answered. However, OAuth 2 is, as you've probably noticed, often incorrectly used for authentication. Now, why is that a problem? In some ways, authentication is a subset of authorization. If authorization is asking, what can this user do? Then you could say authentication is asking, is this user allowed to access my website? So it sounds like it should work. However, for a start, OAuth 2 does not always authenticate the user. You might not have noticed, but when you sign into a website using Facebook, Facebook very, very rarely authenticates you. At best, it will usually ask you if you're happy to give the website some data about yourself. And that's it. It won't ask for your password because you're already logged in in the browser to Facebook. It does it implicitly and you go back. In other words, almost anybody could access any site, authenticate to any site. 
just by having your laptop with a with browser logged into Facebook. So really, there is very little authentication in most cases. Um, the other thing about Auth2 is it allows unattended access without authentication. So again, the system, once you've authorized it, will then be allowed to access the APIs on your behalf for a period of time until either you block access or until that token expires. So again, no authentication takes present, but yet this system is acting on your behalf. So again, very specifically, not about authentication. There were two versions of OAuth. The version one was complex again because uh, without TLS, you might have known it as SSL. Without that, you then have to have digital signatures to make sure that the data is not tampered with on route and that that data um, has an assurance level. And all of that extra difficulty equals poor uptake. Developers want to get into something, understand it quickly, implement it quickly. What they don't want to do is start trying to debug digital signatures because when they don't work, you have no idea why they don't work. You get a hash out the end of it. The hash doesn't match the hash that you should be getting. It fails validation and you don't really know why. If you're writing the library yourself, it's even harder. Uh, but basically, digital signatures equals poor uptake. Version 2 realized this and said, well, OK, if we say that TLS is required, you know, SSL certificates now, they're pretty cheap. They're pretty accessible. Let's do that. And that makes the data exchange much, much more simple because you're not signing stuff. You're not doing all of those horrible things, validating signatures with SSL certificates and all that kind of nonsense. So in essence, it became very popular. Um, version 2 did. The two are not compatible, however. So... Version one is all but dead, uh, although some sites might still support it. In most cases, sites that used to support version one will only support version two now. Um, and again, it makes it much, um, much more easy for the developer. Version two is not quite so um, popular among some purists because it is also a very vague specification, but we'll get to that later. So what are the issues when we try and use OAuth 2 for authentication? Well, we need to restrict any un unattended operations. So if I'm trying to make OAuth2 work for authentication, I'm not going to allow the system to come back with a refresh token to effectively get a fresh set of permissions on behalf of the user. So OAuth2 allows for refresh tokens, but if we want to use it for authentication, we can't allow a system to come back without asking the user in order to get more access to their data. We also need to know that the provider is always authenticating the user when I click on the button. So when I click my Facebook login with Facebook, I need Facebook to authenticate every single time. But unfortunately, we have no way of enforcing that. And we also have no way of knowing whether this has actually happened. So I go to a provider, even if the provider says it's going to authenticate them, I don't know if they have or not. I just get back a code which effectively says, here's your permission. So I can't even tell whether authentication took place. So actually, it still doesn't work, even in a restricted sense. On top of that, the vague specification means we've got very uh, many different implementations, which basically means that virtually every plugin you'll find will have a single class per provider. So you've got your Google class, your Facebook class, your Twitter class, etc., etc. Again, it's all extra hassle when you're trying to implement OAuth 2. And it means that when you're trying to write an identity provider, you end up having to write many, many classes to support all of these different plugins. So this is then where the final one comes along, OAuth2 with OpenID Connect. So OpenID realized that OAuth2 was popular, and I'm sure they realized that OpenID, the, the default protocol, was not really very popular. They also realized that OAuth2 was being misused and said, hang on a second, let's see how we can put the best parts of OpenID, that is the authentication part of OpenID, onto OAuth2. So we make it compatible with OAuth2 so people who already use um, Twitter and Facebook logins and stuff don't need to change their systems massively. They can just put this um, on top of OAuth2, but they then get all the extra bits of authentication. So OpenID Connects added a few more variations of OAuth2. These are called flows, and they're completely compatible with the basic OAuth2 handshake, which is fine. 
And another thing they've done which is very useful is they've standardized some of OAuth 2's vagueness. So they said rather than being vague about what these parameters can be and what they look like, let's actually nail these down and say this is what these parameters are going to be called, this is the format, this is what they're going to mean, so they become more useful. And why does that matter? Because it makes it much easier to implement a standard identity provider, both for the identity provider and also for the relying party who's consuming this identity information. Let's have a standard library that will allow us just to use OAuth 2 with OpenID Connect without having to configure everything um, for every single different person. So they made some small detail changes so there's a few new parameters and stuff like that like you can ask um, the, uh, the identity provider to authenticate the user if they haven't authenticated in the last day for instance um, you they then added some um, some more response types and stuff like that so there's some kind of stuff down in the detail there is also uh, a load of stuff done with signatures. Now, because we're kind of going back to the situation where we're making a claim on behalf of the user, then we need a way for the client, that is the relying party, to actually verify that that claim is true. So what happens is a token comes back, which is signed, and the client then needs to actually verify that signature. Like with most things, these things can be done via a library, and because they're standard, then the library, um, if it works for one provider, it works for all the others. So if you understand OAuth 2, and don't worry if you don't, because I'm going to do another video with more kind of technical detail, then the normal handshake would take place by the browser redirecting to the identity provider, and assuming that the user gives authorization, then an authorization code gets returned back to the relying party. So as well as that, or instead of that, depending on which of these flows you're going to use, you get an ID token. And the ID token is a signed JavaScript web token. And again, depending on what sort of flow that you've used, the token contains various information about the user, including details like what method did you use to authenticate them? When did they last authenticate? And if you want the implicit flow, which is the quickest of them, then the ID token itself could include the details like the user's email address, their name, their address, and those kinds of things. So what it does is it allows somebody who's just using OAuth 2 for purely identity reasons, purely for authentication, to bypass some of the extra functions that need to take place to access APIs, and instead just say, do you know what, just give me that token back straight away. I want to know who the user is, when they've authenticated, and I want their email address. And that's all I need and OpenID Connect makes this very quick. Another thing that it adds, which is not related to OAuth 2, is um, OpenID Connect allows the idea of distributed logout. So if you think about it, if somebody's gone to an identity provider, signed in, and then gone back to the relying party, back into the website they were trying to access, they are now logged in. But if that user then wants to log out, then the website might say, do you know what, I also want them to log out from the identity provider. So I don't want them to be able just to click login and get straight back in again without authenticating. So what this uh, OAuth 2, uh, what OpenID Connect allows you to do is allows the relying party to request that the identity provider also logs out the user. And optionally, when that happens, the, um, the identity provider can then redirect you back to where you came from so that it just looks like to the user that they've logged out. But um, to the system, you're completely logged out and you have, again, that assurance that somebody isn't going to be able to come along, click login and have somebody like Facebook say, oh, yeah, well, they're already logged in. Let's send them back again. You actually you break that. That is optional. You don't need to use that. Um, but it is something that can be quite useful in certain scenarios. So in summary, various protocols exist, as you've probably already know. Some of them are arguably outdated. And um, one of the lessons we learn is difficult protocols don't get embraced by developers. So these protocols aren't winning or losing based on their technical merit or on their security credentials. In most cases, they win or lose depending on how easy it is for a developer to learn what's going on and start using it. People don't like working with complex exchange. They don't like working with signatures, XML and Java um, and all of the kind of overhead that's involved with those things. And for general use, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect is likely to be the future. 
So in most cases, SAML 2 is losing popularity. OAuth 2, uh, people are realizing as an authorization protocol, it's not complete in its own right. And most people still don't like the idea of using OpenID, even though they can if they wish. So most people like the idea of OAuth 2 plus OpenID Connect as a very easy way of getting 90% of the functionality that most sites need. Libraries already exist for some of these things. So for instance, in .NET, there's a library called Identity Server, and that takes care of all manner of things, including automatic discovery, signature validation, all of the kinds of things that you need to do uh, in order to be compliant with the OpenID Connect spec. I'm sure there are libraries already for other languages that also implement OpenID Connect, but as those libraries get extended, there's now a much higher return on investment because if I write my plugin, I want to write it once to work with every provider. What I don't want to do is have to make it work for Google and Facebook and Twitter and everything else. So OpenID Connect should make those things much easier to do. And I would recommend highly for most people in most scenarios just to look at the OAuth2 and OpenID Connect route to in order to um, sign in to authenticate into your web applications. So thanks very much for this. Um, as usual, any questions, comments, anything, please put them below in the YouTube comments. Otherwise, I will see you in my next video, which I'll hope to look at the OAuth2 and OpenID Connect protocols in slightly more technical depth.